you, Max, for the introduction. I, I don't know. And it kind of gets your attention. When you say you're hanging around for 50 years, you might be overstaying your welcome a little bit, but uh, I'm sure that, that you all will let me know if that is the case. Um, I am operating without a watch today, which is a bit dangerous. So I'm going to ask you, Kathy or Max, to somebody give me the high sign, just say cut it off, these people have to go back to work, we're all working for a living here, and uh, we don't have time to just sit and natter all day long. So let me begin my comments with just a thank you. And I do like to acknowledge those who are part of the round table because these are the folks that are making things happen within your community. And so it is important that we acknowledge and recognize them because they do good things. I see so many of you around the room here who we have worked with in, in different ventures, whether it, it's mining, whether it's banking, whether it's real estate, um, you're, you're making things click and that is important for us. Just a couple little things I wanna highlight and I'm trying to recognize that some of you were actually at my legislative speech just an hour ago or may have seen it or you'll be getting bits of it on the news so I don't wanna be a rerun here so I'm gonna try to give you some fresh stuff so if I start repeating myself, Peter, your job is to keep me, maybe do a signal or something. But just in terms of where we are nationally, in terms of our unemployment, we're starting to see you know, the, the, the unemployment at the national level increased um, from 7.8 from in December to 7.9 in January. So that's kind of going back up on the national side here in the state. We're actually going down. I like it when we reverse the trends in a, in a way that's positive for us. We're sitting at 6.6% now, uh, down, down, a, uh, down just a little bit from last month. So it's always interesting to kind of see where we're falling because I think we recognize that our economy tends to lag here. So in the lower 48, things were tough, feel like we're coming out of the recession. But what's happening right now on the national level that's kind of eroding away some of that positive news is what's happening or perhaps not happening in the Congress. What we're seeing right now with what I have described as the situation where we go from impasse on an issue to crisis to kicking the can down the road and then we start all over again. What that does is injects further uncertainty into our economy. And when you don't know what's gonna happen with taxes, when you don't know what's going to happen with uh, you know, new regulations that might be coming your way, when you're not quite sure what the impact of the Affordable Care Act is going to be on you and what those costs might actually be, you're waiting until 2014 to try to understand it a little bit better. Well, when you don't know, the best thing to do is hunker down and not make that investment, not advance that project, not hire those new uh, employees. And so that's what we're seeing on the national level, in my view, in terms of, of why we're not able to haul out of this hole. It's because of the uncertainty. And I, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time on a bank board. I come from a banking family. If you're, if you're in the investment world, you're gonna be a little more cautious about your lending if you're not quite sure what's gonna be happening to your local economy. So we're kind of in this, this situation right now where we need the help, but until we get some certainty, it's not happening. I was asked, by a reporter a few weeks ago. Um, well, actually, this was before New Year's because we were still working on fiscal cliff issues, and they said, you know, what is, what is the one kind of tax policy that, that you can articulate that, uh, that will help with this fiscal cliff right now? What is the one thing that we can be doing from a policy perspective? Is there some level of stimulus that we should advance? It's give some certainty. Give some certainty, and then folks can move ahead. 
And even if the news is bad, even if you know you're going to be hit with, with a, a reduced budget, if you know what it is that you're dealing with, you can manage it. You can manage it. But right now, we're not managing. I, I want to take a few minutes with sequestration, even though I did speak about it in the legislative address, because it is something on deck right now in Washington, D.C. It'll be in front of us and in place by March 1. And what this effectively is, is an across-the-board cut across all departments, including defense, um, that, that just mandates that we five, find $85 billion in the balance of this, this fiscal year. So that's a lot of change to come out of your department budgets. And the way it's structured under this Budget Control Act that we passed, it's, it's kind of indiscriminate. It's you just, you've got to find this level of savings. And so there's even greater uncertainty. You know you're going to get hit with a budget cut, but you don't know where and how it's going to fall. So if you don't know what's going to happen, again, more uncertainty, less action. One of the things that we do know, I think this is important, is sequestration, uh, the way it was drafted in the legislation, allows for a few areas that are not touched. Social Security is not touched, Medicaid is not touched, and certain uh, veterans' benefits are not touched. In addition, our military will continue to receive their pay. That, that is not affected. But, but some of the other areas that we, we will see an impact, we've got um, some pretty substantial military installations around the state. The discussion right now is that uh, federal civilian employees will be furloughed uh, 22 days over the, the balance of the, the fiscal year. On Air Force side, that's about 2,200 uh, civilian personnel who would be subject to furlough. If you look at the, at the dollars then that are taken out of the, uh, of the economy because you're not getting that pay, it's about $18 million. That's just on the Air Force side. You factor in Army. So it's, I mean, again, the impact to the economy, you might not be uh, a, a, a civilian on the, on the payroll with DOD. And you, so you say, well, I'm going to be okay. But if you have a restaurant, if you've got a business that relies on those Air Force guys coming in and, and uh, buying something, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're going to feel that impact. Here in, in Southeastern, look around you. We're surrounded by a national forest. National forest is their, their budget, pretty, uh, pretty important to this community, pretty important to this region. Uh, within the Department of Interior, within the Department of Agriculture, you're going to see full-on, across-the-board, indiscriminate cuts. So what does it mean for the Forest Service budget? I wish I could stand here and tell you what I knew, that I knew for certain what was going to happen. But just last week, I asked for, and we, we had, a full Appropriations Committee hearing directed just to this issue. What will sequestration mean? We couldn't get firm details. We got a lot of, well, you know, we, we're, we're, we may see some furloughs, but we're not quite sure. We'll give you plenty of advance notice. Well, that doesn't necessarily make the family feel comfortable. Um, Homeland Security Secretary Napolitano said, well, if in fact we have to, to uh, make cuts within FAA, you may see um, delays within your airports because we won't have as many FAA employees. And we may see reductions within TSA, so your trip through the line may be lengthened and you may be sitting in the airport longer, but it's a lot of may, may, may. And we don't know. So I'm one of those that I don't want to scare people. The, the world out there is crazy enough and uncertain enough. So if we were to suggest that all of a sudden you need to get to the Juneau Airport three hours earlier to get through TSA, yeah, 
far be it from me to, to convey those kinds of, 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 of concerns. First of all, I don't think it's going to happen. But second of all, um, it's not information that, that we can really count on right now. So there is, there is a great deal at play right now on the national level that will have impact to us. And again, I think it's important to recognize how, how in this state we get the level of federal dollars that we do. About one third of our state's budget comes to us from federal dollars. That's pretty significant. And, and the reason for that, that hefty sum is in part because of our demographics. I mentioned our military installations. Well, you get federal dollars for military construction and, and just for, for the operation of our installations. But we also have the highest uh, veteran population per capita in the country. So there's a lot of VA dollars that come to our state. Uh, 17, 18, 19 percent of our population, Alaska Native, so the, the dollars that come to us through Indian Health Service, those are all federal dollars that come to us, not because we're, we're, we're top of the stack or alphabetically, but because of the obligation to our Native peoples. Think about, think about how our, our land is held and the ownership. Over 60 percent of the state is held in federal ownership. So whether it's Forest Service, Park Service, BLM, um, they're all here to, to help manage. Those are federal employees that are going to be subject to, uh, to the budget reductions that we are talking about. So <laughs> impact out there, I think it's, it's clear that it is coming. What it will actually mean to us, I simply can't tell you with a degree of, of confidence. What I am hopeful we will do is we will say it doesn't make sense to do indiscriminate cuts that can be really quite painful in many areas. Let's try to lessen the pain. Let's try to target the cuts. We know in every, every business, every industry out there, there are ways that you can be more efficient and smart. And then there are ways that you can just try to make a point with somebody and say, well, you know, in an effort to, to cut costs, you're out of here. Let's be smart with how we're doing this. But we've got to recognize it's not just about cuts. There is no way you can get out of a $16.4 trillion debt on just cuts. We would not have an economy. And I've had people tell me, Lisa, all you need to do is you need to cut off foreign aid. We'll be fine. That is so impossible to, to even respond to because it so denies the extent of the problem. Our problem is such that you cannot cut our way out of it. You certainly cannot tax our way out of it. It's got to be a combination of serious targeted cuts. It has to, we have got to reform our tax code. Right now we've got so many, so many loopholes, so many opportunities to, to kind of avoid and evade. Um, but we don't even know what it is that we have. The last time we reformed our tax code was 1985. 1985, not only did you not have a smartphone, you were still attached to a cord by the phone that was plugged into the wall. Um, we've got to reform our tax code. But we also have to be honest when it comes to the mandatory spending side of the equation. This is where everyone gets all anxious because we don't want to, we don't want to rattle those that are on, on Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, our safety net programs. Well, you know what? If we want to ensure that these programs are there as safety nets, the only way that they're going to remain is if we reform them. They're not, dem Medicare is not demographically sustainable right now. You've got more people that are taking out than are putting in. It doesn't last. It's going to collapse. It's incumbent on us to address it. And there are some things that we can do that will not be painful. Right now, 
To be eligible for Social Security, it's 67. Medicare is 65. Why the difference? Well, history, I don't know. Why, why is it not worthy of discussion and debate to, to, to see if we couldn't transition the eligibility age for Medicare up from the 65 where it is now to 67 to match Social Security? Phase it in over five years, 10 years, 20 years so that there's, there is minimal I mean, absolutely no, no impact to the seniors. You don't make it applicable to those who are, are receiving the benefits now. I, I, I point this out to suggest that there are ways that we can and we should address our, our mandatory spending, the entitlement side of the equation. Because right now, 55% of the federal budget is on autopilot. That means that those checks just go out the door on, on schedule without any oversight, any review of the Congress. It's just these are the automatic payments that go out. It's just on autopilot. And what's happening is as Americans are, are aging, as we are healthier, the, the costs to us are increasing because there are more of us. So I'm one that says, show me a perfect piece of legislation. Show me one bill that we have ever enacted into law that is absolutely perfect. And I'm sure I can find some kind of a flaw in it. My point is, we should not be afraid to revisit the laws that we have put in place to make sure that they're doing everything that we need them to do. And again, we don't want things to collapse on their own weight. I've got so much to talk about. I can talk about fish. I hate frankenfish. Um, uh, what else can we talk about? Tsunami debris. We've got to get the resources behind us to help with what I believe we will be seeing in this next year, the year following, to deal with the cleanup. We're pushing NOAA. We get 50000 from NOAA. The Japanese government comes up with uh, a million dollars that would be available to the state of Alaska, but our reality is We've got so much coastline out there. And oh, by the way, how much of our, our, of our coastline can we actually access by road? This is not going to be cheap to clean up. But I think we all agree it's necessary. We have to do it. We will do it. But we're not going to accept the federal government saying, Alaska, you just take care of your piece because it's on your shores. We remind them that most of this coastline that we're talking about, who's the, who's the federal land manager? Well, down here it's all... Tongas, Forest Service, so we're in this together. A lot of discussion going on about the observer program uh, with our fisheries. I've been pushing on them saying, you know, let's, let's be smart about this one too. Isn't there a way that we can do electronic monitoring so you don't have to put a human being on an already small and cramped fishing vessel? Um, we've got some, some issues to, to deal with. We've got a whole host of nominees that will be before us. You can tell I'm just kind of rambling now because I want to get to questions. A um, whole host of nominees before us. Uh, Senator Hagel is the President's nominee for Secretary of Defense. His nomination is not without a great deal of controversy. Uh, in my view, his, his performance and his responses before the committee uh, were really quite concerning. I like Chuck Hagel. His, his son went to school with my son. We know one another on a personal basis. I like the fact that he, he's willing to question uh, but I am very concerned about the statements that he has made about Iran. I don't think we ever equivocate when it comes to Iran. He will, uh, we will have a vote on him when we come back and next week. We've got a nominee that's been presented to us, um, Sally Jewell, head of REI. I love REI. Uh, she's going to have some questions before her. We want to make sure that as a CEO of a very successful business, she has an understanding of what it means to take over the Department of Interior, $12 billion budget, um, and uh, the, the ability to make sure that as we are managing our lands, we're also allowing for uh, the people who live in these areas. And my, my latest, my latest uh, frustration 
is the treatment that the people of King Cove have received at the hands of Fish and Wildlife Service saying you cannot have access a 10 mile gravel, one lane, non-commercial use road that would, would encroach on, on, on a refuge area uh, because in order to respect the refuge you cannot have a road. You cannot have a road. A road that would connect these people to an all-weather runway, Cold Bay, second largest runway in the state. Any of you ever been out to Cold Bay? It makes Juno appear calm uh, in terms of access to the airport and your weather conditions. There is an option there that is, it is, it is straightforward. The federal government gets 300 to one benefit to what the state takes. That's how big of a compromise it, it was. And they still say it's not good enough. They still say we're not going to allow for the people. But this is the approach that the Department of Interior is going to take in dealing with states like Alaska where we have significant public lands. We've got some real issues with how we're going to deal with this. So we've got some interesting things in, in front of us. Um, uh, it's always a challenge. It is a privilege to serve, despite the, the sometimes frustration that you may hear in, in my voice, the opportunity to, to try to address the concerns of Alaskans in, in a place and in a part of the country where most people don't really understand us. They see what they see on reality TV. They come up to Alaska, take a beautiful cruise, and say they've seen Alaska, but they don't know us. And so it's a challenging job, it's a great job, and I thank you for the opportunity to, to continue uh, working for you back there. But work with me on how we can together find good solutions for our state and for our country. With that, let's open it up to questions until Kathy tells me no. Senator, always good to see you. Good to see you. Um, you were just talking about the Department of the Interior. On my way over here, I was listening to Matt Miller on KCMO <laughs> report that the outgoing Secretary Salazar signed his plan for NPRA. And I guess my question would be, is that written in stone? Can the new incoming Secretary do anything to improve on it? I think it's a horrible plan when I know about it, and it's not going to be conducive to Shell's plans or any other development in the NPRA. Well, you're correct. It, it did just come out. Uh, I have not had an opportunity to review it. I've gotten kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version from my energy staff back in Washington, D.C. And what I am told is that the, the, the proposal, the NPRA plan, which we said was flawed in the first place, um, advancing a conservation plan in an area that has been designated by the Congress as, as a petroleum reserve, um, was wrong-headed in the first place. But at a bare minimum, we wanted, we wanted to make sure that there was access. Now, I'm told I had a conversation with Sec uh, Under Secretary Hayes this morning before I went up, up to the Hill, and he tells me that, no, 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 don't worry. We have made sure that there are provisions to allow for access for pipeline. Uh, I'm told that it's not necessarily that clear because what you have is you have the raw, the record of decision, that says one thing. But you have an EIS that says another. What had any re attorneys in the room, you know, if you got one side that says one thing and the other side and another report that says something else, you've got potential for litigation sitting right there. Another aspect uh, of what was released today is apparently the, the proposal that there would be this working uh, group uh, comprised of, of those within the region designed to, to assess. Uh, the management, operations, but also would have the ability to weigh in on some of the boundaries as they relate to the sensitive areas, most, notice, most notably Teshukpuk Lake. What does that really mean? Does that mean that, that there's going to be a situation where, again, if you're looking to, to develop or do something out there, you don't really know where the boundaries are, where you can and cannot be? Again, what does that set you up for? Litigation, stalling, doesn't, doesn't help the plan. So we're looking at it critically, um, but uh, 
I don't think it's going to see. I don't think it's going to be something that you're going to see the delegation embrace uh, with wide open arms. Senator, I'd just like to applaud your candor on the topic of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. I think anyone in Washington that's elected that doesn't acknowledge that that is part of the problem, if that's not sustainable, is not being honest. And I just wanted to applaud and thank okay. you for your candor on that. Thank you. It's tough stuff. It's, it's, you know, it's politically, it's that third rail. Um, but it's going to sink us as a nation. So how we honor our commitment to the safety net and make sure that it's it's not only here today but it's here tomorrow is is what we're tasked to do these are hard things but nobody said this was going to be easy thank you no not yet As you mentioned, uh, there seems to be a, a gridlock between um, the, the parties. And what do you see happening to get things moving um, off of uh, off the stalemate and towards a solution um, between the parties? Because it, it seems like it's uh, so partisan that we'll never we'll never make any progress. Well, I'm going to start my response by saying. As frustrated as I may be on certain days, you don't ever give up trying because it's too important. The work that needs to be done is too important. And so I get, I get just fed up with what I see, uh, with, with the partisan, um, the politicking that goes on, and, and the, the dysfunctionality that then uh, is incorporated. That doesn't do any of us any good. And We've got, to, we've got to get beyond that. It's hard, because these are hard issues. And philosophically, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff where it's not just, we're not just politicking with one another, but you've got a perspective from some camps that say the individual must pay more for the services that we are asking for, and others who philosophically believe that less government is better, and so we don't need to ask for more money. What we need, need, need to do is back off uh, the role of government. So there's some philosophical differences. I respect that. But when we get into a situation where what we're trying to do is to score political points, is to advantage one side or another for political gain because we've got an election coming, and for gosh sakes, you cannot uh, help a member who's up in cycle, that's what they call them when you're running, um, because if they have a legislative win, then they're going to be able to go home and tout that. So if you are, uh, I'll use a very specific example. Scott Brown, the senator from Massachusetts who was one, running for re-election. Scott is one of those pretty easygoing guys and, and works well across the aisle. Uh, but as soon as his race became the one to watch, there was not a single colleague on the other side of the aisle that would partner with Scott on any issue. And Scott's direct enough to say, well, you know, we worked together on this issue for a long time. Why are you backing off? And they're, they're, they're honest with him. He says, you know what? You're running. We can't give you a win. Now, you know what? That's just wrong. Where is the good of the order? Where is the good of the order here? So. Um, it's gotten to the point where it's about winning rather than governing. How do you get back off that? Uh, I, think, I think, quite honestly, um, those who we work for need to not hesitate to hold us more accountable for the governing part rather than just the winning part. And one of the things that can be done, and one of the things that I'm working on as a ranking member on, an, on the Energy Committee, I want to get back to a process that is known in the Senate as regular order. And what that means is the process works. The committees work. The Energy Committee, would, we'd, we'd, we'd call up a bill, we'd give notice, we'd, uh, we'd let members know what's going on. We have a full-on open hearing. Members introduce amendments. We, let, we argue, we debate, we let them, uh, we, we vote on them. 
and then the measure is voted out of committee, sometimes overwhelmingly, sometimes on party line vote, but you've had an open and a transparent process. And then you're allowed to bring that bill to the floor. And on the floor, that legislation is, is subject to full-on open debate by everybody there. Members are allowed to introduce amendments, take them up, debate them, and then we vote. We let the bill that has been crafted by, by a bipartisan group through a process, uh, th that bill will, will, will fall or stand based on its merits. We're not doing that anymore. What is happening is in an effort to make sure that it's a bill that the majority wants, they bypass the committee process. You can completely bypass the committee process. The majority leader can draft up a bill in his office and he can bring it to the floor. It's, called, it's a process called Rule 14. In other words, you can bypass the committee process. Now, Don Cubley's been watching the legislature for a long time. Yeah. If, if Mike Chenault were to dream up a bill in his uh, speaker's chambers and then take it to the floor on Monday with nobody really knowing what's gone on, he might maybe let his caucus know, maybe not, bring it to the floor, put it on the calendar. That's, oh, and then, and then say, and by the way, there will be no amendments because I have, quote, filled the tree. In other words, no amendments are allowed. Now, you've got your minority up in arms saying, wait a minute, this is not right. And even though it might be a bill that I might support, I gotta look at it and say, wait a minute, where, where is the process in this? Why are we not respecting that? Why are we not allowing members from diverse views and opinions the opportunity to come together to build bipartisan legislation that will work for the country? Not for the Republicans, not for the Democrats, but for the country. So that process has been derailed. I think we can get it back. And one of the things that I am doing is personal engagement with my chairman. Ron Wyden, senator from Oregon, new, new energy chair, I'm the ranking member. We pretty much made a commitment. We said, you know what? Somebody has got to start it. Somebody's got to go by example. And if we can do that in the energy committee and demonstrate that we can build good bipartisan legislation that is good for the country and not just for the chairman or not just for the Republicans, but good for the country, maybe by leading, in leading by example, we can change the dynamic. Because right now, the system is not benefiting this country. So some have said you need to just get rid of the filibuster altogether. It's more than just the filibuster. It's really about how we respect a process that honestly has worked for several hundred years until of late. When what happened? We started disrespecting one another. And when you disrespect one another, it's pretty tough to, to, to leave. So I get a little wound up about it um, because I know that our inability to come together impacts the people that I care about, the place that I care about. And nobody likes to talk process because that's not very interesting. But sometimes if we don't have process, nothing happens. Uh, Senator, um, about sequestration, about sequestration. Uh, this morning, Larry Kudlow, a rather famed economist you may have heard of, <laughs> was talking about sequestration. He's like, you know, this is like less than one quarter of one percent of the deficit we're annually running. This is nothing. The Federal Reserve is printing more money every, you know, month then the sequestration would actually cut out of the federal budget. And it's kind of hard to take you seriously when you talk about a budget cut when we haven't had a budget in three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to get this $16 trillion and a trillion dollar a year print or borrowing or printing 46 cents of every dollar the federal government spends to stop? We have to stop it now or we are going to blow up. It's a good point, and your, your comment about what the impact of, of these particular cuts are going to have, it doesn't 
it's, it's not impacting that $16.4 trillion in debt. It's not impacting that deficit. What, is, what it is doing is slowing the rate of growth of that debt. So, you know, I didn't hear Kudlow, but he's probably not off in his numbers and his commentary in terms of, of what this level of sequestration does. My, my beef with the sequestration is that it is absolutely indiscriminate. And so if, if in fact there are, there are investments that we have made that are important, are critical to us, they too are, are on the chopping block. They too are subject to, to the meat cleaver. So I'm not, you're not hearing me say we should not be doing cuts. You're not hearing me say we shouldn't, we shouldn't address the required cuts, which is $1.2 trillion in savings. I'm saying that what we need to do is we need to target them. We need to make sure that to the extent possible, we alleviate some of that pain. And I think that we can do that. I think that we're smart enough to do that. But it, it is, it's absolutely correct when you say we're not reducing that, uh, that level of debt with the sequestration. But keep in mind, too, that what we're talking about right now with sequestration is, is for the most part cuts to the discretionary side of the budget. And I'll take you back to my, my earlier comments. Just focusing on the discretionary side is not going to get us there. It will not happen. And that is why it is imperative that we look to the mandatory spending side. Because that's, that is the part that is out of control truly and, and literally in every sense of the way, out of control. So those are, those are not the budget cuts that you're going to see to the Forest Service or to, to BLM or what have you. Those are the more politically difficult ones that if we don't get a handle on, everything that we would do, everything that we would do on the discretionary side is not going to, to solve the problem. And again, increasing the revenues doesn't get you out of the hole either. So it's it is important to appreciate the extent of the problem that we are in, and I think your comments noted that. One more. Senator, quickly. Welcome home. Thank you. Good to, to be see home. You again. First, I'd like to applaud you for your sentiment about reaching across the aisle. Um, it's old school Alaskan politics. It's the way your father did it and my father did it. That's the way we were brought up. It's really not about D's and R's, it's about A's, whether it's Alaska or America. And I applaud you for that. I also uh, would like to commend you on your, your consistent uh, support, and strong support of the energy industries across our state. Um, I'd like to ask you about one industry that's important, as you know, to Southeastern. I remember you standing there last year and looking out at a, at a blinding rainstorm and saying, we live in the Saudi Arabia of green hydropower. And you're right. And we need it badly mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. this region. Um, but having hydropower designated as green, as you know, would be immensely helpful to our region and, and uh, the other parts of the state that are lucky enough to have uh, natural hydro. Is there any chance in the near future of, of having that designation made or a piece of legislation that you can use as a vehicle to do that? Well, I'm working it. I am working exactly that. I, I have said here, I've said there, I've said anywhere. That, uh, that hydro should be recognized as a renewable resource. And um, I, I always challenge people, come with me to Ketchikan where I was born and tell me that, that uh, hydro is not, not renewable. It rains every day. Um, and we're happy for it. Because sometimes it doesn't rain enough and we don't have the ability to fill those reservoirs. But it is an issue that I think can help make a difference. Because if hydro was, was designated as renewable, it makes uh, available it, it, it basically comes into a different category. And, and whether it can then avail, its, avail itself of, of uh, uh, different credits that might be um, helpful to advance the, uh, the, the, the facilities or, or, or really to, to just move forward uh, our hydro initiatives. I'm working with, with Ron Wyden now um, I'm hoping that we're going to have a, a bill here within the next couple of weeks 
that looks specifically to how we can expedite some of the permitting that goes along with hydro, how we can put forward a, a process that uh, allows us to access this resource um, in a much more effective and efficient manner. Some of what we're dealing with in, um, in the lower 48, as we talk about hydro, is so many people have this, this vision that all hydro is Tennessee Valley Authority, that it's the Hoover Dam, it's the Bonneville, these major massive projects. They don't even know what a Lake Tap Hydro uh, Dam is. Uh, they, 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 they can't understand how you could actually have a dam that doesn't, doesn't have impact on, on your fisheries. Um, they don't understand that when we're talking about hydro, it can be everything from, from conduit to, to, to irrigation ditches. It's a pretty all-encompassing um, uh, definition, if you will. So we've got we've to work to allow people to kind of get outside of their box in terms of what they know to be hydro. Uh, we've got enormous potential yet in this country to generate power from our hydro uh, sources. So this is one area where Senator Wyden, when we first sit, sat down, um, when he became chairman of the committee, we said, okay, where are there areas where the two of us can focus on something to make something happen because everyone's expecting us to do exactly as you have suggested, just kind of, you know, dig in our heels and not make anything happen. We figure there's 10% there's on either side. He's never going to come across to my view and I'm never going to come across to his. But at least in 80% we can talk about it. We may decide that that's not where we're going to end up. But we started first with hydro. He says, I totally get it coming from the Pacific Northwest. We need to be doing more. The country can see the direct benefit, and it's something that can happen in the shorter term without a lot of money. If you can, if you can facilitate a process, that doesn't cost your federal treasury. So the things that we can do to move forward on energy um, that's good for, good for the entire country is, is important. So that's a fun one. Good luck. Thank you. Anything we can do to help from this end? <clears throat> Keep the rain coming. Thank you. Thanks for your time.